All right, check, check, check. Me too. Should I do a Keith special and say, hello, can you hear me? Yeah, that sounds perfect. <laughs> hey you and welcome. My name is Mike. And in this whole episode of the That Chapter podcast, it's a very special episode. Very, very special. And you want to know why it's so special? It's so special because we are going to Australia and that's why it's very, very special. Um, but yeah, no, you know, I'm just sitting here recording the old podcast uh, as we do, as I do every single week. In fact, I'm probably not even going to get to the point that Keith's not here because I think it's funnier if we don't even mention that Keith's not in this episode. I know, yeah, I agree. That's uh, not, yeah. yeah, let's not bring it up. But uh, this whole episode is special because guess what? I have a new uh, special co-host for this episode in particular. Yes, you heard her dulcet tones <laughs> already. She oh. sounds great on microphone, I'm presuming, because I'm not listening to her. I'm recording this. Her name is Regina. I call her Ew. the Ore Dog. You heard a little hail there already. I call her an Ore Dog, and uh, one time I called her the Ore Dog <laughs> in a bar, and somebody misheard me and thought I called my wife the Warthog. Yeah, so... the Warthog. So that's me, all right? Yeah, yeah, you're in for a very special hour of Mike and the Warthog. <laughs> <laughs> How are you? Yeah, not too bad. Um, mm -hmm. You know, as they say, what is it? Uh, long time listener, first time caller. Mm -hmm. Long so. time, first time, long time, first time. Yeah, so because, for... Sorry, no, you go oh, ahead. Okay, look, I'm going to have to Keith you now and say if you interrupt <laughs> me once again. Um, but no, the reason Keith's not here and Regina is filling in for him is we are going on vacation and we couldn't find the time to record one with Keith before we went. Yep, exactly. So, you know, you sound just like Keith to me. Uh, I'm sure the folks at home probably won't even notice <laughs> the difference. I'm not sure. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Let's uh, not think about it. Yeah, and let's okay. just move past this one. <laughs> um, so, yeah, uh, Mike and the Warthog, we're talking about, uh, we're going to Australia in this one. I think that, that kind of covers the basics. Pretty much. Yeah, yeah is there anything be else you want to say before we get into it? Uh, uh, you got any good I jokes just, or I, stories? I, Have no, you got any haunted house stories? Haunted house ones? Yeah. Mm, well, you know, the thing that my sister told me about last time she was here. Oh, yeah. See, her stories are equally as good as Keith's haunted house. Well, I mean, it, are they now? I'm not sure about that, but okay. So the story was my sister told me is that my sister visited home and she was at our house and apparently she collected a ghost and brought it back with herself. So there you go. Um, she had some really lucid dreams since and there's a little girl in them. And uh, one time she even felt the little girl jumping up and down on her bed. So she woke up to that. So happy days. And go. she never had that kind of stuff before. So, I mean, maybe she has a little girl with her now. Wow. <laughs> you never know. What a great story. All right, now let's get into it. <laughs> yeah, just one thing I want to say sorry to everyone uh, about my accent and <laughs> about Keith not being here. <laughs> yeah, I know. They, me doing this. This is, you're completely unintelligible. Uh, folks, you know what? Just listen to me. I'll guide you through this episode. I'll be as quiet as possible, I promise. You know, you could just do us all a favor and just get out. Well, all right. <laughs> <laughs> all right uh, let's get into this whole story. This is the topic we are covering today is the Angel of Belangelo or the story of Carly Pierce Stevenson and Candelace Pierce. Now, so South Australia is where we land for our latest horrifying stop on the world tour of the dark, the spooky, and the murderous is Lee. The Belangelo State Forest in New South Wales might be familiar territory to some, as it was, well, I made a video about it uh, a while back. It's the same forest made famous by Australia's most notorious killer, Ivan Millish, I can I? The backpack killer mice. <laughs> dun, 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 dun. Nice. You're filling in great already. I can just look at you. Oh, my God. It's like having Keith in the room. Millish was responsible, okay, Millish was responsible for the murders of seven backpackers between 1989 and 1992, but was believed to be responsible for a whole heap more disappearances than those folks. If you're interested in more, check out that chapter video I made on him, uh, like, uh... Donkeys ago. Yeah, donkeys it was, ago. Yeah, long time ago. Yeah, a long time ago. But you know what? I'm sure it's, it holds up good. So... It's not a great surprise that when some trail bikers were making their way through the Belangelo State Forest, they discovered skeletal human remains. Now, all of the initial reports latched onto the remains, most likely belonging to an unknown victim of Ivan Millitz. As I said, he has a number of confirmed, seven confirmed backpacker victims, but there's a lot more he's believed to have, uh, you know, done away with. And he did away with his victims in extremely cruel and horrific ways. So, when it was discovered, it was simply believed this was another one. 
There was speculation that the bones could have belonged to a German tourist who had gone missing in the area. Given that... <laughs> that was horrendously bad. Hey, listen, at least Keith pays oh, compliments man. to my accent. Uh, I'm sorry, so great. Not, not this one, not this time, sorry. Cut out. Given that Millet's confirmed victims already included three German backpackers whose bodies were found in that very same forest, it was a logical guess that this was simply another one. There was only one slight problem with that theory. The unidentified remains were discovered on August 29, 2010, and they had been there for less than a year. Ivan Millet had been banged up in prison since 1996. There was no way this could possibly have been a presumed victim of his. So, who was it? And was there another killer out there? Mm -hmm, I know. Let's see what the answer is, shall oh, we? Oh, I can't wait. Forensic testing showed that the remains belonged to a woman aged anywhere between 15 and 25 years of age. Lying just two meters away from the remains were several personal items belonging to the deceased woman, including an ankle sock, shoelace, an earring, and a white t-shirt that, despite being badly decomposed, gave the woman the name she'd been known by for years to come. The word angelic was written above a winged heart and tattoo style rose. This led investigators to refer to the woman as Angel and some in the media to use the Belangelo Angel when seeking the woman's real identity. Along with a sketch, additional information on the t-shirt was that it was short-sleeved, size 10, made by the company Chain Reaction and was only available for sale between 2003 and 2006. Unfortunately, all the fantastic information about the t-shirt would be extremely unhelpful. Other details were scarce, including her cause of death, though investigators did reveal that the bones showed signs of injury. They had also found that the victim's teeth showed signs of, quote, Western dentistry, unquote, but had not found any corresponding dental records. Over the next five years, authorities pulled out all the stops in the hunt for identification of the angel. A facial anthropologist from the University of Western Australia aided the hunt for Angel's identity by recreating an image of the woman's face using forensic photography and modeling. But the hunt for Angel's real name was going nowhere real fast. So it was a year after the remains were found that New South Wales police requested uh, the facial approximation. They were hoping that the results would aid them in identifying the person. Sure. In December 2011, the results were released to the public mm -hmm. via using, you know, the national media. But it was to no avail, unfortunately. So when they put out the picture of the woman, nobody recognized her. Nobody They're recognized like, her. That? Yeah, exactly. Nobody could yeah. recognize her. But years later, when the identity of the person finally came to light. Spoiler alert. The accuracy of the facial approximation was unbelievable. It yeah. was really close to like perfection per se. Like, like it looked scene. exactly as... Pretty much, yeah. Oh, wow. Looking at the two next to each other, you are like, oh yeah, I can see that it is How the exact they same person. It? How did they not get it though when the, That's the question. forensic thing was yeah. put up if it looks exactly like her? Well, it's due to the fact that this method of identification is majorly successful when applied to people that have known the unidentified person. Mm -hmm. The thing is that um, familiar face recognition is a complex process that our brains go through when seeing someone we know. Yes. So instead of like focusing on individual features of the person, we see their face as a whole. Mm. So if you if you know the person, yeah, you look at the photo like this created picture, and then you are like, oh yeah, that could be her. Yeah. But if you see this picture of the person as someone who doesn't know the person, you are okay. like, uh, okay, so she had a uh, big nose, big ears. Uh, you focus her on the individual eyes. Yeah, exactly. things so rather than the Not whole. all together as a whole. Wow. Yeah. That's wild. That's interesting. So it's, it's the brain. It's the complexity of the brain wow. as it works. So that's why apparently the people mm. that knew her, they didn't see the photo that was created. But then later or, on, they're like, oh my God, how did I not get that? I don't know if they were like that, that's but I, I, I only like. assume so because yeah. that makes sense. But mm -hmm. yeah, so it's interesting though. Yeah. Well, Regina, you knocked it out of the park. 
On July 15, 2015, a motorist passing through Wainarka, a very small town in South Australia, stopped to investigate an abandoned suitcase on the side of the highway. Maybe he was hoping there was some dollary news inside. There was not. I don't know what they expected, but I'm guessing it wasn't the remains of a small child. Unlike with the remains of Angel, whose remains could have ended up where they did through a choice they had made, Investigators knew from very early on that they were dealing with a child who had died a very violent death through absolutely no, no choice or actions of their own. This was straight up a murder inquiry. The victim had died years before and their remains were likely dumped by the roadside post-mortem. Like with Angel, the child had several personal items, including several pieces of clothing and a distinctive handmade quilt, and detectives hoped that these could, could help unveil the child's identity. Now, at the time, the case of, the, of this child found in a suitcase and the case of the body found in the Belangelo Forest, they were not linked at all. They were separated by thousands of miles and five years. Following a massive campaign, Crime Stoppers were inundated with more than 1,200 calls from all around Australia. One of those calls, the 1,267th call recorded, was from someone who thought they recognized the blanket found with the child. A second call, the 1,271st, placed just minutes later, confirmed that the first tip was correct. The first caller believed that the quilt was made by the child's grandmother, and the second provided a photograph of a baby named Candelis in a stroller with the exact same blanket that was found with her bones right next to her. A second image showed a toddler in the same pink dress also discovered at the dump site, which was a suitcase on the side of the highway. The police quickly ascertained that official records of Candle suddenly stopped with her childhood inoculations and there was no indication she'd ever enrolled in primary school. Fortunately, DNA is a lot further along from where it used to be and a sample was obtained from the child's remains. That was then tested against DNA, which was on file. The police now had a name for the child. She was Candelice Candle Pierce. She was only two years old when she died. You know, initially when they checked, you know, with the DNA, so when they found the remains, yeah. obviously they took samples uh -huh. to test it for DNA and they came up with 6,300 possible matches. Wow, okay. That's what I always say. Young children, they all look the same. <laughs> sure. So between August and September of 2015, police door knocked on hundreds of households at the area where the remains of the child was found. Mm -hmm. But then, of course, with the information that was, you know, the callers Oh, the gave. tips that were coming yeah, in. Yeah, exactly. yeah, about the blanket and mm, stuff like that's that. That's how they were like, oh, so it could be this person. So they specifically looked into the database and the DNA sample of yeah. that child. And that's how they made the connection. Yeah. So it yeah. was true, multiple different things. Things, but then eventually they made they narrowed it down. Yeah, and uh, again, that DNA kept going because a DNA database search then revealed that the woman who'd been known as the Angel of Belangelo for the last five years was in fact 20-year-old Carly Pierce Stevenson. She was the mother of Candlace Scandal. Up until this point, Carly's bones had been sitting unidentified in the morgue, completely separate from the investigation into the body found in the suitcase but investigators finally had a name to bury the remains under. Everyone involved and those following the investigation were desperate to know who's behind such a heinous crime, a mother and a baby murdered, their bodies in two separate locations. The hunt for the killer was on. Wynarka, by the way, where Baby Candle was found, is nearly 12 hours away from Belangelo, where Carly was found. That's 1,134 kilometers, or over 700 miles, of bush, desert, and cities between the two places. How did it end up so far apart? What happened in between, and who was responsible? But who, really, were the victims? Obviously, due to the young ages of, of really both victims, neither had time to make much of a mark on the world. What we do know is that Carly Pierce Stevenson was born in Alice Springs in August 1988. She attended primary school and high school, where she was a keen athlete, especially loving netball. Carly gave birth to Candlice in 2006, when she was only 18 years of age. And then, less than two years later, aged just 20, she'd be found dead in Belangelo Forest. 
Investigating officers began by piercing together a timeline of Carly and Candle's movements between the time they were found and the last time they were seen alive. They were working backwards. The mother and daughter duo were seen alive on the 8th of November 2008, when the car they were travelling in was stopped by police on the highway in the far north of South Australia, and then again in the suburb of Canberra a month later in December. After that, they were gone. Like, uh, literally, they were, they were missing. Nobody knew where they were, and they were in fact reported missing. Carly's mother, Colleen, had reported her daughter and granddaughter missing in a call to police on September 4th, 2009. Oddly, though, what was weird about that missing persons report was it was withdrawn less than a week later by Colleen, as she had told police she had found her daughter and her granddaughter and that they were alive and well, so, you know, you can close that missing persons report. They're fine. The case was then never followed up on by police. What the shite. The reason for Colleen's sudden reassurance and lack of worry was because she'd received a text and a call in which she was told both Carly and Candelis were, were fine, but simply they didn't want to talk to Colleen ever again. So the thing was that the text message, one of them was about um, apparently Carly asking for money mm -hmm. from her mother, 500... Dollar dues? Yeah, 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 Australian dollars, mm -hmm. which is God Dollary knows dues. how much it is in actual money. In, in non-monopoly <laughs> money? But yeah, so uh, that was one of the messages. And then there were phone calls and some more messages. And they were all about, you know, we're doing grand. We might need some money. Mm -hmm. If you send us the money, we can make Make it back to Alice Springs, yeah. be together, that kind of stuff. Yeah. But then nothing more. Nothing. Then the calls would just suddenly end. And, and Colleen was, was full sure, you know, she was talking to her daughter and her daughter was Grant. And given Colleen and Carly, they had a kind of a turbulent relationship. It wasn't unbelievable that Carly would, would make demands for money, but simply there's little doubt that Colleen still expected to hear from her daughter when tensions died down and Carly felt ready to come back home to Alice Springs. Of course, knowing what we do, it would later become very obvious that the contact was not from Carly at all, and that she was likely already dead when Colleen was talking to some person who was acting as Carly. Police think Colleen never knew anything remotely bad had happened to her daughter and Candle after September 2009. And Colleen died, you know, later on, still thinking that the two were alive and living interstate as she'd been told. After Colleen's death, Carly's extended family continued to try and find information about their whereabouts. None of them had any idea of the horror that had fallen on their missing relatives. It was a complete mystery of how a young mum and little girl voluntarily left their home in Northern Territory for unknown reasons, with their bodies being found hundreds of miles apart years later. It was really something from a movie. So while building on the timeline, one of the first ports of call was, of course, the father of Candle, Candelis, Andrew, who was still living in Alice Springs, Carly's hometown. However, this was a solid dead end. He was quickly ruled out. Him and, and Carly had, had stopped being in a relationship years, years before. He did give them some vital information, though. He told police that him and Carly would often visit friends in Darwin, Alice Springs, Adelaide, and Canberra. Which is like, way to go, way to narrow that one down. That's, that's four major cities in Australia, all on opposite sides of the continent. It's sort of like saying, yeah, you know, we would visit friends in Seattle, Denver, Miami, New York, you know, just the regular, regular cities, you know. Authorities, though, were really throwing all the available resources at discovering the who and why behind the haunting mystery. In October 2015, a major break in the case was announced by the team. They had a suspect. One of the biggest things bogging the team down and slowing progress was the sheer amount of tips and information being provided by the public. Most were obviously duds and would lead nowhere, but still needed to be followed up on, and others appeared promising before being alibied away. Finally, they had a tread which led to a solid suspect, and better yet, they didn't even have to worry about finding the darn guy, as they already had him safely locked away on other unrelated charges. Daniel James Holdham, born in 1974, was already serving a four-year, three-month prison sentence for the sexual assault of a nine-year-old girl. 
Four year, three months uh, is the maximum sentence, by the way, he could get, which is seems extremely low. Oh, yeah. Especially when you uh, hear a bit about what happened or how it went down. Do I want to hear? I mean, I, I'm not going to go into details. Didn't find it. Didn't even want to find okay. it because fuck me. No. Okay. Um, the victim was his neighbor. Mm -hmm. He was staying at a caravan site. Yeah. With like other trailer people. Park. Yeah, yeah, like a trailer park thing. Yeah. So he was staying there and the little girl was his neighbor. He denied the allegations once the little girl told her mother about what had happened, mm -hmm. but obviously they looked into the case and they found evidence, meaning they found his DNA oh, on the little girl's uh, underwear. And he was convicted of having sexual intercourse with a child under the age of 10. And for this, as you were saying, the maximum sentence is fucking four years and three months, and Oof. that's all that is. Oof. Jeez, I read through the bucket of them there, huh? What the no, actual... No worries. Wow. Yeah. Well, it was then that Daniel uh, Holdem's name went to the top of the list of, well, their own investigation into the murder of a mother and daughter. His history with the law went back to 1999, when he had broken into a woman's home and attacked and strangled her. After serving time for that one, he then caught the law's attention once again when he persisted in stalking a woman and breached an apprehended violence order in 2001. Apprehended violence order is like a restraining order, except much more serious as the person used violence. Holdem was charged in Carly's death on October 28, 2015, and then with Candle's murder the following December. At first, Holdem made it clear he was going to plead not guilty and fight the charges in court. But a week out from trial and faced with the enormity of the evidence against him, he soon crumbled and changed his plea. So, yeah, back to his rap sheet yeah. regarding the previous crimes and all. So the 1999 incident, that was actually against his ex-girlfriend. They have had a fight, uh, she wanted to break up with him, and his retaliation was to break into her home and try to suffocate her with a pillow. Nice. I don't know why he was out on the streets by 2001 already, so mm -hmm. he was sentenced for this crime in 2000. Yeah. But by 2001, I don't know when exactly that year, but at some point he was already out on the streets because that's when the stalking case was against mm. him. I don't get it as like maybe the the first victim didn't press charges that I, I'm not sure what he was convicted for, couldn't find the papers for it. Anyway. Sure. But the stalking case as well, like he would follow this woman to a child care facility. Yeah. And like physically lock her in using his car so that she couldn't leave with her car as like cornering her and stuff. Wow. So it was really intimidating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Again, I don't know what he was, you know, given as a sentence or mm -hmm. what, what was the end result of it. But Jesus Christ, like he has some behavioral yeah. issues, all right? He definitely does. Also, after all this, he once again got into the police's radar mm -hmm. when in April 2008, he was involved in a car accident yes. that left his passenger wheelchair bound and uh, passengers, two children who were in the car, lost their lives yeah. in the accident. Boy, woof. Yeah, listen, hey, bad luck. Some people just bad luck follows them everywhere, you know what I'm saying? More like they are the bad yeah, luck. Yeah, oh yeah, we'll get into it because he was a real sick piece of shit. Now Holdem, he suffered abuse from a very young age himself and he'd been raised in foster care. His own mother said that the day he was born, quote, something dark was born. He turned to drugs and alcohol in his teenage years and built up a long string of failed relationships, often packing his bags as soon as things got even remotely difficult. Along with the relationships, he also put together a long history of petty crimes, often running little cons and schemes to make a dishonest dollar or two. He somehow ended up in a relationship with Carly. See, something that had been kept from the public when the bones were originally found was the cause of death of both Carly and Cannell. It turns out there was a there was a good reason because honestly the details are pretty horrific. Carly's bones showed evidence of someone forcibly kneeling or standing on her chest. Basically, she had multiple fractures consistent with an adult man standing on or more likely stamping on her chest along with being strangled to death. Her throat had also been stamped on. What happened to her own two-year-old daughter is even more disturbing. 
Investigators think Candle was probably killed in a hotel room and she had been found with several dish cloths balled up and stuffed into her mouth and then tape wrapped around her head. Holden was connected to the deaths because yeah. first of all, he was only arrested on charge of one murder. Yeah. The murder of Carly. Carly. Yeah. And then it was months later he was charged with candles. Exactly. So what happened was that his phone was pinged at the Belangelo State Forest at the time when Carly was killed, which yeah. was the 14th or the 15th of December 2008. Mm-hmm. Now, according to two acquaintances of the couple, on the 14th of December 2008, the couple was at Canberra. Yeah. And they had an argument, after which they got into Carly's car and drove off, uh, leaving uh, Kendall behind. Yeah. And then the next day, mm. Carly's car, and then he picked up the child, and then he drove off. Yeah. So the drive anyways to the forest, it takes about an hour and 45 minutes drive. Okay, right. So during the drive as well, you would be thinking, you know, what Carly was thinking, where they are going, what's yeah, going on. Right. What was the reason of them going there anyways as yeah. well. It's just so out of the way. What's the point of it? Right. And then once they were there, apparently he assaulted her with foreign objects as well, oh like sexually assaulted her before he murdered her via stomping, stomping on, on her, her and then breaking her windpipe and yeah. she died that Jeez. way. So once he then drove back on the 15th of December, mm -hmm. he then drove off to Wagga Wagga. Wagga Wagga, hey, listen, they got Apparently, some great old names over there in uh, Australia. Yeah, around, around that area anyways, as far as I can tell. And that's where he booked a motel room. The information the police found during the investigation, he signed the paperwork yeah. and that he was in the company of a child. Yeah. And then he went off to a convenience store later on, Bosch, duct tape, some wipes. The killer's, the killer's bags, bags. Yeah, the killer's... Stuff like that, yes. His tools. And then when he checked out, he was alone yeah. already. And of course, after he has admitted to his partner, Hazel, that uh, his motive was sexual gratification. Yeah. Once they found the recovered the remains and all, they couldn't tell because it was so decomposed. They couldn't tell if the child has been yeah. assaulted or not. But knowing his... Uh, Predilections, uh, you can pretty safely assume Knowing his a past, yes. yeah. you know, what he has done already. Yeah, you can It's not far-fetched that, right. you know, yeah. If that wasn't enough... Their killer had even done his very best to make it seem as though Carly was still alive and well. Unlike in most cases, it wasn't done primarily to just, you know, throw people off and make them stop tracking down the mother and daughter. But was for nothing more than just personal gain fueled by pure greed. Carly's bank cards had been continued to be used for a long time after Carly was known to have died. In total, Carly's killer had stolen more than $70,000 using her cards and personal documents and even texting her family asking for money. Much like we said, with someone had been texting and calling Colleen after Carly was dead. So why? Why had Daniel killed his girlfriend Carly and her, her, her young daughter? Well, several motives have been put forward as to why he killed them. Money was just, was just one wee rancher. Another was his, something else we brought up, his sexual fantasies about children, which he was already doing time for. But he never actually said why he killed them, even though he, he would plead guilty. Almost 10 years after the discovery of Carly's remains in Melangelo Forest, Daniel Holdham was sentenced to two life sentences for the murders of Carly and Handley's. Holdham did try and make a last minute appeal, trying to go back on his guilty plea and force a trial, but the judge refused. These sentences mean that Holdem will die in prison. Now that's where I usually would be leaving things. You know, another job well done. But there's a bit of an addendum to this uh, to this old one, as there are a lot of unanswered questions that open up a can of very strange worms. The matter of keeping Carly alive in the eyes of the authorities to be able to, you know, claim and withdraw the money in her name after she was dead. Well, that definitely leads to questions about an accomplice. He would need someone who sounds like Carly on the phone to call family, call her mother, show up at banks. Just so happens that Daniel had an ex-girlfriend named Hazel Passmore. Police investigators looking into the identity theft and fraud of Carly found 
that a woman had visited a credit union in Adelaide in 2010, claiming to be Carly Pierce Stevenson in order to update their records. Carly had been dead for a couple of years at that point, so they knew it couldn't have been her. Then, a woman believed to be the same one that visited the credit union had attended a Centerlink in December 2010. Now, Centerlink, for those wondering what the heck that is, it's responsible for Australia's social security services. Now, as we mentioned, you might notice I deliberately avoided saying the mystery woman had walked into the offices. That's because she was wheeled in, and that was Hazel Passmore. Hazel Passmore, the lady whose two children he killed in the car accident mm -hmm. and who became wheelchair bound because of him. Yes, yes, she, she stuck by her man. Hazel and Holdham had met in Queensland in 2004. And despite Daniel going to, to prison just after they met, Hazel, whoo, head over heels in love with him at first. The two uprooted their lives and lived a transient lifestyle, traveling up and down the east coast of Australia with her three children, those poor kids. Hazel, this is where things get even wilder, Hazel then filed a suit in 2011 against Daniel because he was driving, alleging that, you know, she had her employment prospects crushed by the loss of her leg and injuries. I guess she didn't give a shit about her two kids. The fact is that if Hazel's suit was successful, Daniel wouldn't have actually had to pay a penny. It would have been settled by a third party insurance company. And that immediately grabbed Hazel and Daniel's attention. She could sue her boyfriend and he wouldn't lose a dime. So, had these two proven to be reprehensible people staged the crash deliberately because they are two fucking idiots and it just went horribly wrong and Hazel was seriously injured and two of her kids died? Who knows? Court records showed that the case was settled but lawyers on either side never commented and the outcome wasn't disclosed. The 2008 crash took place weeks before Carly and Candelise were killed. Hazel was in hospital when the murders actually took place. The whole thing was that uh, after the crash has happened, Hazel was brought to hospital to recover sure. and everything, go through all the treatment she needs. That's when Carly and Holdham got together and uh. became an item. Mm. Yeah, he didn't, he was like, God damn, you Wasting lost one of your no legs, time, you're yeah. no use to me no, now. No, exactly. So he really, yeah, as you said, he wasted no time. Busy man. He's like a famous ladies man, but I don't, I don't get it how. Like, yeah. you look at him and he just looks evil. His eyes are dark as hell. He kind of, like, I don't know, he looks scary. He well, looks like a predator, like proper, like full on. Do you know what the answer is? No. Drugs. <laughs> yeah, yeah, all right, okay. Hazel Passmore was instrumental in convicting Daniel Holdham, despite initially saying she would stand by him. <laughs> I don't think she's going to be doing much standing anymore. <laughs> in the end, though, she did testify against him. Relaying to investigators a confession she said uh, Daniel made to her after she found Carly's ID and she accused him of cheating, which he did. She told him Holdham had broken down and told her he'd murdered Carly and kept the stolen cards in order to claim her benefits and access her wages in her bank account, which she also did. According to the account he gave Hazel, Daniel Holdham stamped on Carly's throat and crushed her windpipe, causing her to suffocate. He also told her that he'd sexually assaulted Candelise before killing her and putting her body into a suitcase. She also told him that Holdham had previously shown an interest in child-focused material and had pushed her to reveal details about her own experiences of abuse as a child for his own pleasure. Hazel continued to support Holdham, though, telling investigators it was out of fear that she stayed. She stayed with him out of fear, which is like the good old, hey, listen. I was kind of forced to, you know, the good old get out of jail free card. Hazel's statement, though, it was made on the provision that nothing she said could be used against her, which probably and unfortunately saved her from a prison sentence for helping with the fraud and, well, knowing about the horrific murders. So Hazel, she found uh, Carly's pension card, her Medicare card, and also Kendall's birth certificate mm. in Holdham's uh, car. So mm -hmm. that's when she was like, all right, how come you have all this stuff? You know, what's going on? Are you cheating mm. on me right now with this person? Yeah. And then eventually he broke down to her and said, so this is Hazel's part mm -hmm. uh, and it's in her police statement. Yeah. And it goes as I quote, I was yelling and screaming, what the fuck is this shit? I was going off my nut and he pulled me inside literally by the scruff of the neck. 
he threw the chair, he starts shaking me and he's like, she has disappeared, she's gone, she's gone. And I'm like, what do you mean she's gone? And he's like, she's dead, she's dead. Mm-hmm. Another big breakthrough and something that proved vital in putting Holdem away was Hazel's discovery of an SD card in 2010. The card contained images of Carly and Candelace, both pre and post mortem. The judge later described the images as a trophy. Another horrific revelation uh, at Holdem's sentencing hearing, and we're not short of horrific revelations about old Danny Holdem, was the discovery of a notebook with a long list of children's names with either the word forced or consent next to them. Um, let's just quickly move past that because that is too fucking dark. Way too dark. Yep. It's thought that Carly had met Holden by chance and he likely had been flush with cash from dealing drugs and charmed her into tagging along with him and he probably used drugs to control her. Following Holden's conviction and double life sentence, Carly's biological father told Holden in a victim impact statement that he would like to see him get the death penalty, but also admitted that even that wouldn't be enough to satisfy him. Carly's stepfather said in his statement that Carly's mother, Colleen, continued to ask, is Carly and Candles here yet? And still hope to see them to the moment she died. And that is the end oh, of this soul one. Well, yeah, I like how you said that. That's it? Yeah, Thanks. that's it. At no, least I Keith mean, pretends to be. Nah, no, sorry. I just, I have more details that I can sprinkle in. Police later found during the investigation, they found uh, notebooks that belong to Holdem. One of his favorite things to do was apparently to write um, sexual assault stories. Mm. And he would keep the best ones and put them inside books as well for keepsake. And he also had the notebook that you were talking about mm. beforehand. So, I mean, God only knows if there's like more victims even or, wouldn't you be know, surprised. Uh, wouldn't be surprised either. Yeah, no, I, de I definitely think that there's a likely probably a lot more yeah. victims out there. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Listen, we don't, you don't know and you don't want to know. No, but not But that's really. where we will wrap up this whole episode of the... That chapter podcast. All right. Thank you so much for listening, uh, y'all. It means the world to me and to Regina, who's sitting in for Keith for this whole episode. It's been, yeah. it's been swell. As always, check out uh, new episodes of the That Chapter podcast, which are out every single Monday, Monday. Give it a go. And also check out the That Chapter videos, which are out every Tuesday and, you know, most Fridays. Not every Friday, but most Fridays. But please check it out. And uh, yeah, here, listen. I hope you have a great day or night or morning, you know, whatever time of the day it is, wherever you're listening to this. Take care of each other and yourselves. Because I love you. Bye. Uh, come on, dude, dude, Keith stuff. Yeah. There you I go. Can't do it, right? Listen, that's great. Let's <laughs> leave <laughs> there. All right. Thanks, guys. Right, bye. Given that. <laughs> <laughs>